Okay, welcome everybody to our uh, live stream event um, from How to Repair Pendulum Clocks. My name is Matthew Reed, and uh, some of you will be regulars, so welcome back. Okay, welcome everybody to right, our uh, usual um, um, technology. Pendulum clocks. My name is Matthew Reed, and uh, some of you will be ah. regulars, so welcome back. Usual. Um... Thank you. Great. Well, <laughs> there we go. Welcome again. Now we've got this um, sound turned off at this end. Hope you can hear me. Uh, the um, over the past few weeks, we've been working on an early nineteenth century European, uh, probably English, tall case clock or long case clock, and we're going to continue tonight and for the next. However many weeks it takes until it's until it's done. Um, been an interesting week horologically, I think. Uh, for those of you who are watching this live, then remember that on Saturday coming up, it's the Antiquarian Horological Society um, AGM, and the theme is time and observatories. And this morning on Radio Four, again, if you're watching this live, if you're not, then um, oh, I can see the um, I can see the live chat. As multi Matthew, gosh, what a terrible idea! Um, uh, this morning on Radio Four, there was a program uh, that you can. They used to call it "Listen Again," didn't they? Call it "Sounds" nowadays, and um, nowadays, they, it was about uh, the longitude and um, three academics there uh, discussing the long longitude, uh, which was I thought really cool. It's interesting. Um, I was well, not exactly involved in that, but slightly tangentially around the turn of the millennium when I was at Greenwich and it's nice to see at least from an academic perspective how the story has changed or how it's been starting to be reinterpreted in a in a different way uh, particularly of course to do with trade and uh, how that scene um, uh, today very much changed and I loved it at the end where the, in the kind of summing up, Melvin Bragg was, um, you know, asking for that that kind of final thoughts, and of course the longitude prize of seventeen fourteen was it? Gosh, it's, I've forgotten all this stuff now. Uh, was really one of the, if not the uh, government in this country's, it was a government funded research project, and I think it was one of the first, if not the first, and quite sort of made me laugh. That from the perspective of the academics, of course, they said yeah it's really important that the government continues to uh fund research so i thought that was quite nice they turned it around and um so cool that was nice there was also i saw on linkedin today one of ferdinand Berthu's weight driven marine timekeepers experimental marine timekeepers which uh, was kind of featured by a repairer so it was cool to see that as well if you're interested in that story of course you will know um greenwich and the collection there but if you haven't been, absolute um, cr critical importance to go to the collection of the muse uh, Museum of the History of Science uh, in our oh, Arts and Machines, as a metier in Paris, particularly if you ever get a chance to go to the reserve collection, which is a kind of purpose built building on the periphery. I think maybe the AHS has, has been there. You used to be able to go and book with a group. But if you're into clocks and machines, uh, yeah, the Musée, Musée Aze Métier uh, on the periphery, the sort of reserve collection is really one of those sort of life changing experiences. Anyway, um, do regulars get a free pint? Regulars do get a free pint. Yes, of course. Um, yeah, absolutely. Just uh, making a little amend to my bench here. Oh, those were the days, eh? When you could sit and have a pint. Although, of course, you can nowadays outdoors, can't you? I'm too, always too busy, uh, riveted to the bench, of course, to do anything like that. Anyway, our live stream clock, um, the pub clock, actually, uh, as you uh, mentioned it, Sam, 
here it is from um maybe that's what we should do when we're when this clock's repaired we should go to the we all meet up in the pub in york where this lived and um toast its uh, good health anyway that's a plan <laughs> it, who knows though what's going to have happened by the time we actually get the thing finished it's going to be um well into the summer at, at least anyway because i talk too much so just Take out some pub clock parts. Slightly disconcerting seeing that YouTube thing. Oh, that's better. Right. Okay. So pub clock parts. Uh, for those of you who are new, um, last week we made a spring, which I was uh, playing with before. Thought I'd lost it for a minute there. And here it is. So this is our new uh, rack spring. And as you can see, it looks like a, a bit like a pig's ear because we um, rescued the uh, original or earlier foot, which had been soft soldered onto. And here's our uh, previous, so, they, so you can focus. Here's our previous rack spring. We did away with that by popular demand and we put a new one on, which is um, tapered like this. So that's cool. It needs a bit more tidying up down here, but um, we're kind of good to go, really. So sort of moment of truth, really. Let's just udge that out of the way. I win I know you like the use of the word udge. Um, and what else do we need? We need our rack back and we need oh, that's not it. We need our rack back. We need our rack post, which, of course, last week we took out again. No. Doesn't matter how many times you take all these things out, it's going to be the one that we try last. So, yeah. Just move it out of the way for a sec. Um, so, pop our rack post in. There we are. Don't need um, a little bit bent, actually. Still a bit bent. There's our rack. And I think the intention was, it's been so tempting. I was looking at this clock earlier today, kind of trying to get my brain in gear for uh, what we're going to do. And it's so tempting to tap this hole with a BA thread, like take about 10 seconds and then put a screw in there to hold it down. But the hole hasn't ever been tapped. So I'm kind of duty bound to uh, to not do that. So uh, for the time being, anyway, and to get really frustrated, then I'll just tap it out. So what we're going to do is we're going to pin it on. It was kind of riveted on when we um, when we found the clock, but I'm just going to pin it on so we can uh, remove it if necessary. The first thing I need to do is the uh, foot of the uh, rack spring has kind of got bent back a little bit. It's probably really soft. Um, from the soldering, maybe the previous soldering as well. So it's not fitting flat, sitting flat. So I'm just going to kind of curl it up uh, a little bit. Um, is the camera going to focus? Yeah, after a fashion. Right. Come on. Curl that up a little bit. That, that you can see yeah there we are so it's just got a bit of a bend in it so at least when it sits down on the plate it um, i'll move that across that makes it um at least when it uh, sits down on the plate it looks kind of planted there we go and as we said we're going to just pin it on so i'll get a taper pin here's one i didn't make earlier so just a tip pin like that and if we're in luck and when did luck ever have anything to do with it that's just going to hold it on uh ça. okay i'm actually just going to draw file that because i think it's going to drop out and embarrass and embarrass me so Um, we'll 
I think it was Saturday when we did our open clock club, somebody said, I don't know whether they were joking or not, maybe they were just <laughs> teasing me, but they somebody said in the chat, what's that book that Matthew's always banging on about? Um, not the Gaisley, which has gone off to uh, America, by the way. Did it go to America? Yeah, it did, because I looked up on Google Earth where it was going. So the, the book, the Gaisley Escapements book has disappeared. Uh, and um, I'm telling you that. Well, the other book I was talking about on Saturday was the book that's up there just behind the camera, our How to Repair Pendulum Clocks. But I guess you regulars um, all know about that. But on Saturday, I'm going to mention it again and remind people of the suite of uh, things that we offer. It's going to get the little device. Come on, camera. including um, Facebook. So if you're new to this thing, then please look us up on Facebook, How to Repair Pendulum Clocks. We've already, uh, it's Thursday, isn't it? Time flies. Um, we've had a good old week. In fact, today has been a bit, um, a bit crazy, really, really good. Lots and lots of input. Um, there seems to be a bit of a comptoir's clock theme at the moment. So if you don't have a comptoir's clock, which I don't have a comptoir, Twelve o'clock, but luckily managed to find some pictures of one from when I uh, worked on one a few years ago. But that seems to be the um, the order of the day. So here's our pin, and yep, I play this right in the focus thing. So here's our pin, and as always with taper pins to prevent them from dropping out, I'm just going to draw file it like this. So I'm rotating it in my fingers and using a, a pretty coarse, sort of well, happens to be a half round needle file, just drawing it along its length. And that really makes them stick in the holes so you don't have uh, that problem anymore of them dropping out, especially these so-called universal pins, which are actually a bit more tapered than the, um, don't need that, do we? Don't need the frame, the back plate. No support chat yet from how to repair pendulum clocks team, how to repair pendulum clocks, but I think that'll come online in a bit. So here's our rack and there's our rack table underneath. So we obviously want this to bend around uh, something kind of like it did before. I do actually want to bring it as close as possible to the bottom of the frame. So I'm just gonna sort of mark on uh kind of where i want it to bend something like that so um, i want it to begin bending here so to make the spring as long as possible maybe it was shorter than that uh the original one but we don't know because it's gone okay uh so gonna just bend it round i think i did actually um last week yeah i saw these last week i was talking about uh these um pliers and I know uh, you guys like a tool, um, you people like a tool. So these are, I thought, I thought they disappeared in the dim distant past, but they haven't, they're still here, um, which is pretty amazing really. And um, there, I should, this should be one of those quizzes. So um, for those people who um, uh, also go to the thing on Saturday, then maybe we should keep this to ourselves. Uh, and I'll, I'll offer these tools up and see if anybody knows what they are, so no cheating. Not for giveaway, I'm afraid. Not yet, anyway. Um, they're bow making um, pliers. So they're for watch, you know, what people call pocket watches, watch bows, uh, the thing that goes on top of the pendant. And you can see here, there's this brass lined closing jaw. And then when you pivot this bit down, so they're pretty rusty and yucky, there's um, an opening. Uh, device here so they're kind of quite useful and when I thought about bending our rack spring I thought ah, oh, I know what I need to find those pliers I thought they'd gone but they haven't they're still hanging around um, which is really nice I wonder what to make there oh they're T so so they're um 
Yeah, you probably won't be able to see that, but they're uh, Swiss made. Just about focus on that thing there. So quite nice if they need a good scrub though, I'm afraid, a bit yucky. So check this is the right way round, which it is, and then get this the right way around. I'm not sure at all these are the tools for the job, but I just want to use them for why not indeed. It would help if I did it the right way around. Yeah. So yeah, that's it. See, they wrist won't really bend around in that direction. Mm. And not at all the tool for the job. <laughs> Right. Okay. That didn't work. I know what's going to happen now. It's going to snap off. But it's a bit better. Our good old round nose pliers. Oh, yeah. More tools. Nice uh, super tools, in fact. Let's see if they are super tools. Strong. Metal is really seems really strong. Except that isn't going to be too so like far down. No, that's all right there. So I'll just continue in the same manner. Keeping everything crossed that it's not going to snap off. Could bend it round a bit of wood, like my uh, trusty uh, drumstick here. But um, anyway, maybe these Wilkinson pliers, which I don't think I've used yet, are going to be do the job. There we are. Not too bad. It's got a little bit of a kink in it here from the uh, slightly um, difficult beginning of that process, but I can. Just straighten that out a little bit. What team open clock clubs just turned up. Uh, Sam says that he's going to buy his all a pint when the clock's done. Great. They're all going to come to York on the bus. Great. We're going to go to the pub where the clock was, and Sam's going to buy us around the drinks. It's a student pub, so that won't be an expensive round of drinks. All right, okay. Um, unless... Thumbs up, Sam. Sam doesn't know that I can drink 10 pints. <laughs> I'm sure he probably imagines you can. Right, there we are. So don't know about that shape. Maybe it should be a little bit more sort of angular. They're usually kind of a closer loop, aren't they, than that. But uh, anyway, so let's just move it away from the frame a little bit. Gosh, it's incredibly strong, that... Um, uh, hammer hardened brass, crazy strong. How many pairs of pliers does it take to make one simple bend in a bit of metal? Many. There is to bend it out, but of course, as it was pointed out last week, because it's soft soldered on, it's not massively massively strong down there so i don't want to push my luck and um break it off so just going to bend it around so it 
just away from the plate a bit more because it's touching on the plate as it is. A little bit more. There, that should be away from the plate. Great. That's really important. I've mentioned this with springs before. But on uh, hammer springs, you know, the one that lies inside the back plate of a clock like this, and on those ratchet click springs, it's really important they don't touch the plate because that alters the effective length of the spring, and it also squeaks a lot on a hammer spring. You, you see these, again, touching the plate a lot, so that's free there. So I think all we've got to do now is to do the next tricky bit, which is to bend the uh the end that engages with the rat tail now on these you want it to be like any spring really you want it to be uh i think with the ratchet click spring we talked about the so-called sweet spot didn't we of uh i'll just turn that light down a bit so it's not quite so glary that's better um that sweet spot so it wants to be as close as possible to the underside here of the rat tail uh, in that corner, but it doesn't want to be actually in the corner because if you look, what happens here is that this distance uh, is further away. Is um, what's what's I'm, what I'm trying to say? It's moving round an arc, so there's a close there's a point where it's closest to this pin, and then it moves away at either side. And I've seen that where the rack can actually kind of stall if the rack spring is touching. This radius here, it's not the best point to stick, is it? Um, we come across the whole time sort of uh, intermittent faults. That's one of the biggest um, challenges in fixing clocks. The faults that are obvious from the off are obvious. It's the intermittent faults that really drive us crazy. I think one of our Facebookers has got a French clock at the moment that sometimes it stops striking, sometimes it doesn't. And this is a cause of one here. If the bend in the rack spring is too close to the body of the pipe of the rack, it can touch on this radius here. And believe it or not, you can get to the point where the rack doesn't fall. It just stalls with it jammed under there. So as much as we want it as close as possible to the bend, we don't actually want it um, touching this part here. But we also don't want it down here because the rack is going to have to uh, move the rack spring's gonna to have to move too far. Uh, what will happen is we want it to be up here somewhere and for it to slide along neatly as the rack falls and then is gathered, or as the rack falls and then it's gathered that way around. So again, let's just get that on the so-called right side, correct side of it. And we can put some marks on here. You can see, again, I don't wanna, there we are, push my luck. Uh, we can put some marks on here of where we think the bend needs to be uh, with our Sharpie pen. Sorry, so it would, it would bind? That's the word. That's the word. Thank you, Derek. It would bind. I've seen it where a, 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 a clock has actually stopped striking for that very reason that it's um, that it's binding if it touches that that end. So, so. Simon's got a question. Simon's got a question. Right, great. Wouldn't there be more leverage if the spring is touching the outer bit of the tail? Yeah, that's what we don't want. We want the the um, leverage of the mechanical advantage to be reasonably as small as possible because if um, the, the spring is very uh, strong or it's operating at a large radius, then what happens is the rack when it drops, so the rack starts off gathered up something uh, like this, the rack drops, and particularly in the bigger numbers, sort of the 10, 11, and 12 striking, it drops right down here. Um, what happens is it breaks the rivet here, or breaks or damages the rack um, arm here as well. So uh, it's, it's quite an interesting little experiment actually to get the spring and just to try and find that sweet spot where it, the spring can move the component. It just wants to flick it as light as possible. So very much rule of thumb, and I'm not massively keen on rule of thumbs, but sort of just enough plus about five or 10% 
just to make it work. When the rap drops, I think it's always really nice when you just hear um, uh, th it, that sort of slightly bouncy flicking action rather than something that's very percussive because that's just going to cause damage. The other, um, the flip side of that, of course, is that when the rack's being gathered, uh, so the gathering palette here is churning away, when it's working against the really strong rack spring, it's got more work to do. So that's going to be more um, uh, wear on the palette, uh, gathering palette face, which you're going to get to in a bit, and also on the rack teeth as well. So I think a good rule of thumb with springs is just to get them working enough and then uh, plus a little bit, whatever that little bit is, of course, we don't typically quantify it, but five to 15 percent, I suppose, something like that. Wolfie says, are you using Sharpie on old clock bits? No, I am using a Sharpie, but I'm only using it on my new new stuff. I know Wolfie's only pulling my, Chris is pulling my leg. Um, no, but I, I think on the, the the wheel, rogue tooth wheel, that's now turned out to be an eccentric wheel, I think I am going to have to uh, use a Sharpie on that. I can't really think of another way of doing it um, just to mark the high point of that wheel and the high point of the collet. So, yeah, um, well, it won't be the first time I've been pilloried for hypocrisy, so might as well go for it. Flyers, no, know. still haven't found them. I was looking for them today. They, I have no idea where they were. I thought they were going to be in my watch, a uh, lathe, collet box, and they weren't in there. Um, I've got a slight sneaking suspicion. And I've forgotten the timeline now. Of, I've maybe left them at the Bose Museum, sort of, as I think I've had this joke last week, when you do an operation. Not that I do op many operations on people, but when you're here in the newspaper where somebody's had a scalpel left inside them after an appendix operation uh anyway it's probably that they probably find the swans jammed and then it's got the pliers sticking in its neck or something who knows anyway uh no is the answer so a bit morose not morose what's the word team open clock club where you bereft bereft that's the word No, I haven't found them. I suppose I have to buy another pair, but then I'll have two pairs. Another. You've got two pairs for everything else. <laughs> eyes. <laughs> One pair of eyes. Right. Okay. So again, double, triple checking before I. Yeah, I think that bend should have been a bit uh, narrower. It looks a bit like a U bend, doesn't it? It looks a bit clumsy. Um, might try and close it up a bit. But anyway. So uh, there we are. We've got our. Um, Sharpie pen marked on our new material. Um, of course, it depends what you mean by new. And so we want the bend to be about at the end of that mark there. Slightly less clumsy than the... Um, You sometimes see these, uh, try to get to focus. You sometimes see these where they, somebody's bent it round in a hook because um, they can slip off. Uh, so you could do that, I suppose. I don't really have any um, problem with that. If it, start, if it continues, to, if it slips off, then you could put a little U shape in, uh, in this bit, again, using one of our many, many pairs of pliers. Um, Well, let's have a look what that's like. We'll adjust it, obviously, when we get uh, the whole thing finished at the end for that sort of flicking action that we want. So there we are. Might actually be a bit long. So I can just bend it down a bit here. Just have a look and check it's not rubbing. No, it's not. Oh, gosh. Very pleased with that. So again, 
you can see slips along there nicely just comes right up to the corner i'd say that was um that was a result quite happy with that sorry about the focusing yeah that's what i mean by it slipping off look i mean it's probably never going to fall back that far mm, let's see how it goes maybe it will maybe i should put that um little u shape thing because you don't obviously don't want it working its way off like that i've only had a smaller pair of um round nose pliers just have a look get this right not sure about this move. I've always um, slightly frowned on those uh, springs that are curved round. I can always bend it. Um, now I think when it's pinned on, it's gonna be fine. And it'll wear a groove in it eventually anyway. And No, I think it's okay. I'm not going to bend it. Good. I think that's done then, isn't it? Uh, success took a long time. But um, so the take homes or whatever they call it nowadays, take home, take away from this in uh, management speak, management circles, is that I uh, was happy saving the foot of the rack spring. Um, the soft soldering was fine. We haven't We haven't um, had to remove much material from the foot of the thing, and I haven't tapped the plate. So all those things are good. I think my the bend here is too large. It looks ugly, a bit ugly, a bit numb. But as you can see, for those people who weren't here before, by filing it, we, we've got this nice fly fishing rod sort of effect where the thing bends evenly along its length, which uh, very happy with that um there we go that's that's that done so i have to move on to something else now any questions no good all right okay uh, i won't leave the pin that long uh, when i uh, finish it but actually what i probably will do is leave it reasonably long i'll probably leave it sticking out like that i don't think there's any need for it to be short and it'll mean the next person who comes along doesn't have that problem of uh, of punching out the kind of rivet like uh, like we did. So uh, yeah, I'll shorten that a bit. Good, right. One more job ticked off the list. I think we might stick on the. Um, just had a sort of slightly frustrating hour before uh, we went on live stream, thinking about repivoting this center wheel. I'll just talk you through it uh, very quickly um, because it is a bit of a pain. But yeah, for because we get lots of questions on the Facebook about buying a lathe, buying lathes. And as I, you may or may not know, I've got an eight millimeter watchmaker's lathe, not a bigger lathe at the moment. So everything's got to work like that, and it does cause you know a bit of a bottleneck from time to time. And this is one of those occasions. But as always. There are workarounds, which um, are cool, actually. You know, it, it makes you, it's part of frustration. What do they say? Necessity is the mother of invention. So I'll just show you uh, my kind of setup and ideas. Um, stick this up on here. Yeah, Jones very nice work. By a, what? On the lathe? No, no, very nice work. Oh, the thing that you've just done. on the spring oh thank you jeremy that's very kind thank you oh um could we just tell jeremy that um might just go to manual focus here to try and otherwise the lathe isn't going to know what the camera's not going to know what the heck's going on uh jeremy if you didn't see my tweet the icon uh video is now up um jeremy uh again had a bit of a problem 
signing onto the icon. It's not massively intuitive. So anyway, the video is up. If you go to the icon website, that's our dynamic workshop. Don't quite know where the next one of those is going to be. We're just thinking about how it's going to figure out. Okay, so just a little recap here. Uh, one of the wheels out of this clock that we're working on, the so-called pub clock, uh, see here, centre wheel, often is the case, for some reason, the centre wheel rear pivot of um, a toll case clock is the first one to fail. It's probably something to do with the fact it's on the back of the movement, and therefore it gets a lot of convection currents, particularly in, um, in buildings where you've got wooden floorboards, lots of sort of rising... Uh, heat. So we can imagine this clock was actually on the first floor of this building, because we still know the people who lived there. And um, so they're all the, you know, the pub, the fire's on downstairs, and the people are in the bar having a drink and a um, pickled egg, as we do in the north. And <laughs> Sorry, those people who live in Sussex, you, I should give you a warning, really, should I? You need to put your fingers in your ears. Um, anyway, uh, so, so, and all that stuff, rising up, drying up the oil in our long case clock. And so I think the centre wheel back pivot, because it's exposed like that, and also it's probably the heaviest, hardest working pivot for its diameter, almost kind of seems to fail, go rusty, and then wear away. And in here, you can see it's actually uh, broken off as well. So needs re-pivoting. Now, um, in another life, what we might do is get go to our Shaolin 102 or our MyPad lathe or uh, sort of larger for us clocks people lathe, hold, make a little brass protective piece and hold the pinion in a collet like this all the way up here, bish bash bosh, easy life, file the end of the pivot off, uh, find the centre, drill it out and it's done in 15 minutes. However, that's not going to happen here because I don't have that uh, capacity. So what I can do, and it's not the end of the world, uh, what I can do is hold, I'm not holding the, um, the front bearing in the collet so it doesn't damage it. I have got a collet that fits it. Uh, and the way that you would deal with this is to use um, a lantern runner. So a thing like this, apologies for those people who know all this stuff, but this is kind of meant to be for beginners. So how you deal with this is that you have uh, a device like this uh, with lots of um, different holes in it, different diameter holes in it. And that fits over the pivot end like that to support it. And then you get your graver. So pretend this is our graver and you can work in here. You can cut the pivot off, you can find the center and then you can drill in. And all this works round this is the tailstock. So all this works around this device here. So this kind of tailstock runner. Um, let's just have a little focus. There we go. So you can see here that there's a, um, a hole that's concentric with the tailstock. And into that fit these runners, these devices, like that. It's probably a bit rusty. But anyway, so that goes through the center. So you've got this one here that you could hold the drill in, for instance. We've got another one yeah, here with uh, a center in it. So you put that through there and you can find the center and you can use this center to align these uh, holes, which are offset here. So we put that in there. We can use that to line up like that and then you can drill through from the back and everything's uh, tickety-boo. Um, however, I repaired a clock by Henry Hindley last year, I think it was, and the same thing had happened, the center pivot took completely rusted away. And I was really frustrated because this runner isn't big enough. Um, you can see this, this biggest one is just too small for these clocks. Now I got away with it on the Hindley because that arbor was a bit finer. Um, but I can't on this clock. So I went on eBay a few weeks ago, bearing this in mind, and bought this chap, which has uh, got bigger holes in it, which is brilliant until today when I came to fit it together and do the job. And of course, these are different sizes, so they don't actually fit. 
So um, deep despair over the whole thing, what to do. I suppose I could go and buy another one of these, maybe if I can find one that's, that fits this runner, that the whole thing fits together. But actually what I'm going to do, because this hole in here, you can see these holes are tapered. This hole is about perfect for our arbor. Can you see? Just sticks through enough um, to enable us to access that pivot. So that diameter hole in there is absolutely perfect. But this doesn't fit in the lathe. We could work with this device, which goes in the tailstock like that. Bit of a faff, but probably allow me just, not ideal, allow me just about enough access to that thing. So what I'm going to do anyway is I've, I've got two of these, um, and I'm sure you um, brainy people will have some ideas. I've got two of these. So I'm willing to sacrifice this one. Um, you can always buy another, I suppose, because I can think I can unscrew it. I've never unscrewed on these, but it looks like it's screwed on. Maybe it's a trick. And then take this one off its center and put it on there so I can use this. Or I think actually what I'm going to do is I'm going to go on eBay or any other internet auction site, and I'm going to buy one of those car, um, tungsten carbide circular burrs sort of um, thing that goes in a Dremel or a drill. And I'm just going to open this up uh, to size. In fact, that's exactly what I'm going to do. I'm going to buy a burr for a fiber or whatever it is, because um, this is hardened. So you can't just kind of go in there with a um, you can see I've already had a little go at it with uh, a tungsten carbide cutter thing, but it wasn't big enough. So that's the way forward. I'm going to buy a burr. I'm going to open this up. And so uh, bespoke for um, this arbor, you can see it's not quite there yet. And do that. Just before we move on to the next repair, which I'm thinking on my feet here, I'm deciding what it's going to be. I think it's going to be the gathering palette. I'll just show you a device like this that I made for my uh, bigger lid when I uh, had it. Um, just see if I can find it. Uh, Derek, yeah. a good suggestion. You can make one for the length of brass in tool rest. Mm. Yeah, uh, in the T rest. Yeah, that's a really good um, idea, Derek. I've seen that uh, done before. So I think, the, I think the suggestion is to, rather than having that circular thing that gets in your way the whole time, um, get another one of these, because you'll need one T-Rest to hold the graver. Probably get one of these that's fixed. The flip over ones are always more desirable than the fixed ones anyway. So get one of these that's fixed, take this out, put in a bit of brass, a brass sheet or something, solder it together and then drill a hole in that. So you can put this way you want, and then that leaves you completely unencumbered. I think that's what you mean. And if so, that's a really good idea. Um, so yeah, may maybe do that, buy another one of these. Um, I don't have two, I don't think. Um, just so yeah, there's another way out. So this is the one that I made for uh, my lid. So this would fit uh, a Myford a lathe, it's just a standard two Morse taper thing that you buy on the internet for a tenor or something. And then I drilled it um, in there, turned it down, drilled it, got a little drill chuck from, uh, I think this was from Southern Watch and Clock in those days. I don't know what make it is. It's this little Swiss thing, I think. Let's see a thing. Oh, it's a lack. Yeah. Simon says uh, you could turn down the shoulder of the new piece. Yeah, well, what I want, I, th I think Simon uh, lost the wheel now, which is uh, moderately inconvenient. Oh, there it is. Um, yeah, of course, this arbor here. Um, what I want to do, again, you can't really see. I think we zoomed in as far as we can go on a bit more. Um, you can see there is kind of tapered, but what I want to do is just to snick off the pivot here. I don't want to actually damage this if I can help it. It's going to burnish it running, in, running on it a little bit. Um, so I'm going to try and preserve as much of this as possible. 
um, in order to to hold that. What I could do as well, I could go get a bank loan and buy a Shelbling one or two, but it would probably go through the floor. It's so heavy and hold it in a collet like that. Anyway, we'll work around it. So as always with these things, um, unlike some, I uh, shouldn't really bitch too much, but unlike some fora, uh, <laughs> that there isn't a right way to do it. Um, so I'm dead interested in all your ideas uh, of different ways. There are always different ways and work around. So all we need to do is to get that center in there concentric. Then we're laughing because you can just hold the drill by hand and the drill will follow the center to a degree. And we can always turn a little bit later to um, bring uh, concentricity back. So, yeah, so this was the, exactly the same as a watchmaker's thing. Got a little... Uh, chuck in there for drilling by hand so it doesn't grab again and then I made up two plates so exactly the same principle oh I see it's held on with an allen screw and then um, this is a bit of chunky old gauge plate so I just drill holes in this as I need them for specific pivots and then I made up a plate here with a like a jacko runner thing on as well drilled a load of holes when it was bigger then turned off the edge for uh, resting pivots on there for pivot polishing, which I don't do anyway, so this has never been used, joke. Um, just to torment myself even more, I wonder whether one of these holes would actually work. No, it's too thick. This piece of material is too thick for this job, so it doesn't work anyway, so that's good. Right, so what next? Swig of tea, I think. I'll try not to lose that. So maybe if I can, I'll order the bird today uh, and maybe we can actually do that next week, depending on how we get on with the rest of the parts. Go back to Walton focus, there we go. Always worrying, isn't it? Rooting about looking for all the components, which we, uh, well, there's one half of it. So there's our uh, gathering wheel. And if you remember, the gathering pallet is, uh, the end is missing here again, and the gathering pallet is split. I can't, another, <laughs> maybe slight problem with the, uh, Taking clocks apart and having them in bits for weeks and weeks and weeks. Embarrassingly, can't see the gathering pallet now. So that is going to. Should have found it before I went there, shouldn't I? That would have been uh, hmm. oh well. Um, <laughs> unless you can see it, I can't see it. You can see pretty much everything else. Just look in the we took a lot of parts off and put them in, wrapped them up and put them in another tray. Uh, I'll just get another tray, but otherwise it looks like, well, it can't have escaped from the tray. Lot of to play with parts when I first start doing this. It's the gathering palette. The gathering palette. Panic over. 
on camera. There we are. Beautifully organized, of course. <laughs> now I know what's going to happen. It's not going to be in here either. There we are. Phew. Right, okay. <laughs> There's our gathering palette. Great. That's all go back. Ah, oh, the beauty of working live, eh? I brought it on myself. I've only got myself to blame, as my granny would have said. So you may remember this, um, the gathering palette is a bit of a crazy uh, shape, but I believe it's okay, sort of original to the clock. Um, and it's this really kind of long thing which spans several teeth. Now the, I think this has been, this design has been the downfall of this uh, uh, component, because of course, talking about mechanical advantage and leverage, um, this thing, actually, no, let's see the way around. Is it my physics is uh, hopeless too. This thing is locking. So this is rotating. And which way does it rotate? It rotates that way. So this is rotating like that. And it actually locks at a large radius, doesn't it? Um, mm, physics. I'm sure one of your people out there are much better at physics than I am. So is that beneficial in, in terms of whether uh, the turning moment on here or not, locking at large radius. Mm. Anyway, um, out of my depth there, it's split basically. It's split along the back here. And it's split at the side as well. So um, on the Instagram page, I think there are some pictures of this. It's really uh, in pretty bad shape, but again, it's, um, probably original to the clock, quite happy to try and keep it, but it's going to have to be silver soldered. Soft solder is nowhere near strong enough to uh, to preserve this, to hold this. And also I think the, yeah, the arbor, there we are, the arbor end, if you can just see there, you can see the pinhole. So it's broken through the pinhole as well, which is, um, which is uh, difficult. So uh, we're gonna have to drill and extend the arbor a bit. And I also noticed that the gathering pallets seem to be kind of blocked up with something. Right, okay. Yeah, so somebody's made a vain attempt uh, to solder it on and they've filled it up with soft solder. That was never gonna work. Um, there is no way on earth that is ever gonna be held on with soft solder. So two elements to this. The first one is to uh, drill this out and uh, hard solder a new bit on. Just um, maybe uh, Simon's point, but you've got options here. So predictably, what I would say is I would begin by trying to drill this bit a, um, a little bit to get a kind of key there. Uh, hard solder, oh, put my hand in front of the camera, hard solder a new bit on and then file that down square. Or, of course, what we can do is we can chop it off here and drill into the arbor and, uh, and put a completely new bit on. Or we can chop it off here and drill into the arbor. The problem with this bit here is that there's really not much difference in diameter. So we're going to have to drill quite small. I don't know what advantage that would give us. Uh, whereas at least with this, um, we can just turn a cone in the end. We can offer up a bit of steel. We can hard solder that in. It doesn't matter if it's Jeffrey Bungle and Zippy, we can then file it down uh, to match, leave it as long as we want. When we've repaired our gathering pallet, we can stick the gathering pallet on. We can scribe across on that material and we can drill a new hole, which in theory should be where the old hole was. Um, what you sometimes see here on these repairs 
is, and I totally get why you would do it because it would be quick and quick and easy, lemon squeezy, is just to put the two components together and drill through both and put a new pin through. Um, but I don't, I don't want to do that. I think that's probably not the way to go. Uh, so uh, yeah, we're going to so soften this a bit. I think it's going to be really hard or pretty hard to snap off. Um, say at this point we don't have enough files yeah it's pretty hard so um what i'm going to do is i'm just going to let this back to blue uh just to try and uh, anneal that end uh, a little bit the pinion's quite a long way away so i'm not particularly uh, bothered about kind of protecting that from heat or something. So I'm just going to um, get some of the tarnish off this surface. I'm going to let it back to blue and then I'm going to um, uh, drill it. I'll try and drill it. Now, of course, the next question is, can I do that? Will it fit through that runner in the in the watchmaker's lid? I've got a feeling it might. Uh, we might be in luck. Um, or what I could do, actually, I might do it that way around. Uh, it's kind of doesn't make any difference really. But what I'm after is a, a male cone and a female cone to fit those together that just enables me to hold it straight while we soft so while we hard solder. So actually what would be a heck of a lot easier would be just to turn um turn a cone onto the end of this. Uh, that would be a lot easier, wouldn't it, than trying to hold it and find a corner. Let's just see if it fits in the lid first. If it does, then maybe we'll go in that direction. Derek says, what about sleeving it? Um, well, what we could do, uh, it's a good point. We could, because this is too baggy anyway, it's going to need filling up with a bit of brass and a bit of hard solder, it's certainly possible to um, have something bigger here. Uh, I don't want to open up the front front bearing. So what whatever I do, I'm going to try and maintain this across flat size, at least in the first instance, because I think that's the least uh, interventive process. Um, right, OK. So um, yeah, I mean, yeah, I, th I think I'm going to do that. I'm just going to hard solder a bit on. I'm going to try and file it first. But again, we're in exactly the same position with this. Uh, we need this hole opening up a little bit. But it might be, uh, I suppose I could break the habit of a lifetime and actually measure it. It's incredibly close to fitting on there. So I think what I'm going to do with my tungsten carbide bit that I was trying to open it up with before, because got one of these um, tungsten carbide engraving cutter things, uh, which you can see has had a massive amount of hammer, but it might be that we can just um, open up the back of the um the hole there to get it to fit so let's just look for our pin vise Means uh, sleeve and silver solder and then file square. Sleeve and silver solder and then file square. So, all right, Derek. So, do you mean put um uh, actually uh, put a sleeve over the whole thing, then solder it, and then yeah, good point. Um, yeah, that would be uh, easier in a way, wouldn't it? So, what you could do is to, in fact, that would mean mean the whole thing was nice and square um drill the end of a bit of steel and um slip that whole thing over hard solder it on silver solder it on and then file away the excess to get a kind of effectively a, not exactly a new square but 
uh, yeah, that would work really neatly. I I agree with that. My slight problem here is that I would probably struggle in the first place, um, maybe not to drill. It's about two and a half millimeters drilling to the end of um of a, of a piece of steel. But yeah, to make a a whole kind of female bit that fits over this assembly, hard solder it on. And the only thing I, I would think about that is that we'd have to probably apply a bit more heat here. I'm going to have to, when I solder it, somehow protect this pinion. But yeah, there are, um, again, many ways of uh, dealing with these things. So let's just see if I can open this up to just get that arbor to fit through. Very, very close. Yeah, there we are. That's all it was. So now in theory, we can, um, yeah, I'll do that. It's going to be easier to turn a female cone um, inside the new bit of metal than it is to try and do it the other way around and turn that on here. So all I need to do really here is to file a cone on the end. I will just let it down a bit first just to, because it's going to be softened anyway by the hard soldering. So uh, just let it down a bit, get my... Um... I think Phil needs a new wick. We'll have some more. And let's just get some of that tarnish off. Definitely where um, a bit of abrasive paper would probably be the right tool for the job just to clean up one surface. Just let's turn it down a bit and then sleep. All right, okay. Yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. I'm with I'm with you now. Yeah, so turn this round basically off to a taper, sleep it, solder it all together, and then just file in your square. Yeah, perfectly reasonable way to uh, to do it. Again, um, I think if I had a, a, diff, a bigger lathe at my disposal, I'd probably do that because it's going to be stronger. You're going to have much more um, interface between the uh, the two comp the two bits. Right. Okay. So let's just. And the good thing about the spirit lamp here is it will just bring up the temperature relatively slowly. I'm not massively worried about heating it. I mean, it's going to be difficult to protect. I think what I'm going to need here is a bit of brass, a biggish piece of brass or aluminium might be even better sort of drill to clamp around the um, to clamp around the pinion when we had solder it. Otherwise, that's going to get soft and right out again uh, with somebody on the, the saturday thing oh no the icon thing was talking about laser welding again if you've got that facility available to you then maybe you could just weld a piece on the end a micro laser weld a bit on the end i think that would probably work really well um and then of course the local the heat affected zone is relatively uh tiny Right, okay. So that's, um, you see, just blued there, but I've not allowed the heat to travel up to the um, to the pivot. Well, I have, it is hot, obviously, but it's not uh, gone blue. Right, let's get that set up and um, just, just gonna file it. Might try turning it, but I think I'm just gonna file it. Try not to. <laughs> Lose the gathering palette again. Okay. 
right just click this move that out of the way There we go. Uh, actually, just before I um, begin hacking at it, with a file. They're running reasonably concentrically. Before I start hacking into file, I'm just going to measure it because um, if all everything else goes wrong, then um, at least I'll know the value of that pin and also the more, more sound effects rummaging around in them, um, rummaging around in the rough at all. So it's About seven and a half mil. Yeah, seven and a half mil to the center of the pinhole, and I'll just get my little. Oh, this this uh, square is tapered. So it's about one six five across flats. The thicker end. Put that down. So let's see if we can get this uh, thing to actually work and be of some use. I should uh, line it up first. Good for once. You can see that, see how that works. Got the center in here and um, lining it up. Tighten that up. Don't need to worry too much about that being tight because it can rotate about a center. Remove that bit. That should now go through there like that, extend that a bit, which is gonna undo my good work lining it up. Have it. It's a bit dry. I've put a bit of oil on. 
So this is um, a useful place. Or that old oil, the oil that's expired, things like this. Let's just put a bit of oil on there. Sorry for squeaking. So, not really sure. I can see that. That's quite good. Evening focus. Yeah, not bad. Um, of whether I turn it or file it. I think I'll start by filing it. I've got a feeling that turning it is going to just make the graver sort of bump around a lot. So let's try filing it first. So we've got uh, probably four cut by the look of it. It's been used on a bit of wood. Oh well. Shame on me. Uh, file there. So just file off the corners first. I'm going to file nice and slow. Where you've got hardened material like this, um, you can usually get away trying not to ruin my file it is filing but it's pretty hard might just go for some glasses i'm not resting on the lathe by the way it might look like it i am but um even I'm not quite that much of a watcher. Yeah, and this steel that's hardened and tempered really such a joy, actually. Yeah, on some on some steels that are really difficult uh, and you want to file, if you file dead slow, and I really mean dead slow, you can sometimes, a bit like... Um, drilling the pivot out, you can sometimes get the thing to start and keep cutting. Whereas if you get your file and you just file it really quickly, the local heat, I suppose, just uh, makes everything harder and ruins your file straight away. Right, I think we've about gotten the... Um, I think probably do need the T-rest on, although I'm not sure how it's going to fit in there can't remember whether i've got um it's useful to, on these t-rests to have one with a narrower um t on it for this kind of work just have a quick look for one can't remember i've got one or not on an earlier topic derek says you can get a paste to keep heat away you can cool gel yeah i think it's really good john's got some used by jewelers That's a good idea, actually. Yeah, good point, uh, Derek. You can buy cool gel, which I think is used by jewelers to keep heat away from a component. So with this, because you've got to get the metal glowing, as you know, to a hard solder or to a dull glow. So we want to protect that pinion if we can, and the pivot as well. Don't quite know how that's going to work, but uh, um, it will work. This is. So yes, yeah, so I've got um, a T rest here uh, that's been cut down, especially for a job like this. Just what we need. The question is, can I work that, that round that side?
who said it was going to be easy. Let me just get it close enough to use my graver. So that is now right, okay. Touching on there, so it's got an angle. Something's touching. Sounds absolutely terrible. Put myself on mute, really. Good, Am amazingly uh, successful. It's going to um, just because it's that file is actually quite coarse. I'm just going to get a graver and just tidy it up a little bit. Doesn't matter um, because it's gonna we're gonna solder to it, but just looks a little bit ugly. I've just uh, got one of those gravers that's made out of uh, an old uh, tungsten carbide drill that broke off as they do and now the problem is i'm not going to be able to get that close oh, that can rotate can't it that's the beauty of that ha. love it that can rotate move up Cool. That's one half of our that particular stage. Let's see for the focus it a little bit more. Anyway, where well you can see that. Um, so all I've done there is just turn the cone on the end of the arbor, but that's good. Now do the other bit. So I'm thinking as I'm going along. Um, yeah, sorry. <laughs> sorry, my head was in the way. There we are, you can see that I have uh, turned the cone on the end. Sorry about my head being in the way. So I'm just gonna get a uh, the female version of that put them together and then hard solder it. So the question is what material I'm gonna use. I could use a bit of, uh, it's 1.65, isn't it? So that, well, I suppose I can measure the arbor, but the across, flots, across flat size is root two times 1.65, whatever that is. It's quicker to measure it and to get my calculator out. I'll tell us what size stock we need. So uh, two and a quarter mil. Um, probably use a bit of blued pivot steel, I think, uh, which is going to make the, my life tougher in terms of, uh, of in terms of turning that cone. But what it will do is it'll help 
be in terms of those kind of materials being the same? Could you silver steel? But there's a chance, I think, with silver steel that it's just going to get like really hard when we solder it, and then it's going to be a pain to turn the square down again. So let's have a let's start by going with some blue pivot steel. Find a bit that um, fits in the sea of, to sea of tools here. Blue pivot steel or blued. I think it's blued, blued. but I don't know. Um, is he in there? Yeah. All right. Okay. Um, so, Team Open Clock Club said, "Is it blued pivot steel or blue?" Well, I know Ian that you've got the world's uh, the national collection of that material. So maybe you'd be so kind at some point to look on the packet and see how it was described, whether it was described as blued pivot steel or blue pivot steel. I'll just move that out the road for a sec. I do have a couple of packets, but I don't think the labels are in good enough condition. We've got the wire, brass pin wire, but the um, Blue, oops, blue, I think it said. Anyway, Ian, if you can confirm, that would be all add to our knowledge. So uh, what do we say? Two point, two and a quarter, wasn't it? We could obviously start with something a bit bigger. It's not gonna be a problem. Two and a half. There we are. Good. So when you've got a new piece of blue pivot steel, um, super caution with the ends. Again, uh, I don't know if you can see on the end, but if you look on the smaller pieces, you can see where they've been sheared off. And they're like super, super hard on the end. You can barely cut it or drill into it. This looks like it's not sheared off, uh, he said. This has been um, rolled to cut it. So a bit like when you're doing plumbing on a copper pipe and you've got those roller cutter tools. This looks like it's been cut in that way. It hasn't been sheared, but it means that that end for some reason is particularly hard. So I'm going to cut the end off. Otherwise, it's going to cause a pain. So I'll go get a collet. And um, then I could actually let this down. Um, that would help me, wouldn't it? Yeah, it would. I'll do that. But I'll get a collet as well. said it's going to um, be heated up anyway, so might as well make our life a little bit easier by uh, setting fire to something.
because normally I would do that on a heat proof mat. <sighs> A bit warm. Get rid of that. That back. First thing to do is cut it off. Might be able to sew it, but I still think it'll be too tough. So, uh, that I'll keep my head out of the way I'll try doing it by the camera So all I'm doing here is just cutting the end off. And we are scrubbing and uh, reasonably flat. Good enough for this. So the next thing to do is to cut in um, and turn the cone. So I want to find the center. Uh, but I really um, don't think there's any way I can do this without getting my head in the way. I'm sorry about that. Yeah, it's nearly time to go. So. I can spare you this pain. Thank you. 
just use one of these um, sharper carbide engraving bits. I think maybe that'll help. Otherwise, what you'd normally do is get a lozenge graver, you know, one of those really thin ones. But I've just got a feeling that the uh, frustratingly, the tip's just going to continue to break off. Let's try this. These things don't actually come to a point. They're, they're made with um, a kind of nominal 0.1 millimeter radius on the end. So might have to sharpen it up a little bit. This. Roger. And see how this cuts. In fact, the lid like so many things on here now, it's not impossible to move around. If the lid like that, you can see. Ian, after quite a lot of discussion, Ian thinks blue does. Blued. Okay. Well, I agree. It's much nicer if you got one of those posh multi-fix motors. Anyway, not nicer, different. As you can see, I'm kind of bludgeoning it into uh, into submission. Anyway, I don't need the cone to be quite as deep as the uh, the one, the point on the gathering arbor because we need a little gap there for some silver solder. Otherwise, when we file all the solder away, file all the solder away, the thing will fall apart again. So we want a kind of, uh, like when you're welding, I suppose, a little space for that stuff to go in. Depth of field is pretty tiny. So you see, the uh, the whole point of this is just really so I can get it aligned as much as any kind of um, mechanical strength. That's pretty good. Quite happy with that. As I say, I can't really go much deeper because um, if the two cones are a really sort of full fit, when I, um, when I file the solder off, then it'll fall apart again, uh, which is, of course, why Derek said to sleeve it. And I get that if you turn the square off and put a pipe over it, then you don't run that risk. And it is kind of quite risky in this respect. But uh, so there we are. But you can see um, those two components now. And because we're using this nice long bit of steel, let's just put them together. They are um, good. They're going to fit together. So we'll pin this down onto a board, uh, one of those soldering boards, and then hard solder this chunk on. And then we can start filing it down. And the beauty is, we, of course, we've got this bit, this long bit to hold on to, so that makes our life uh, a lot easier. But I think as we've done our hour and a half, we will do that next week. So 
next week will be hard soldering. You saw us soft soldering last week on the rack spring. Um, thank you, Jeremy, for your kind comments about the rack spring work. And so it'd be nice to do some hard soldering because hard soldering is really one of those many, many, many things that, um, again, when I started, which is my kind of whole motivation for doing these things, just like very difficult to find somebody to show me how to do it and couldn't do it. I didn't realize why I wouldn't solder, total frustration. And like with all soldering, uh, what you need to do is you need to get the material clean. It's got to be super clean. You've got to have somewhere for the solder to go, which we have got in this case because we've uh, got those two components that have got a gap, little sort of gap between them. And then you've got to get the work up to temperature before you put the solder on. And in the case of hard soldering, silver soldering, that's sort of very dull uh, red. So that could be uh, good fun for next week. You need a heat sink. I'm going to get some cool gel, get one of those burrs for the runner, for the, um, the, the tailstock thing. And uh, hopefully next week we'll solve this on and then we can begin to uh, file our square down. So all good. Thank you so much to Team Open Clock Club for helping with the live chat as always. Uh, and uh, thank you for following along. And all being well, if you're watching this live, we will see you on Saturday for, oh, there's been such an avalanche of interest in escapement theory. And as you well know, my math is pretty um, hopeless as well as my physics. So that's going to be fun delving into that a little bit more um, on uh, escapement theory. So anyway, hopefully see you Saturday. If not, have a great week and we will see you again soon. Bye. Mouse.